Well, no, don't touch the button, right? Hello, everybody. How are you? Oh, come on. It's lunchtime and we're feeding you. How are you? Uh, well, I'm excited about this. It's been a quite some time since I've been back on the stage of the place that uh, it all began for me in this space here at Brookings. But more importantly, I'm talking about a topic that is very important to me. Um, and we're doing something really neat right now, which we probably in a million years would have not have thought we could have done. We're in person, and for those of you not here, we're eating lunch. Yeah, lunch. <laughs> and for those of you that are here, we're actually here, right? So we're sort of doing this hybrid thing, which I think is interesting going forward because it allows so many more people to participate. So thank you to our event manager, Catalina, and our AV crew for making this work because this is uh, just new for everybody to be able to have a hybrid experience. I'm Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee. I'm the uh, senior fellow here and the director of the Center for Technology Innovation. I do have a forthcoming book that will be out in January, finally, on the U.S. digital divide, digitally invisible, hey, she's uh, how the internet is creating the new underclass. And I'm particularly excited about this conversation because as I share my age, even though I don't look more than 15, 20, <laughs> Uh, I've been here before for three decades working on digital divide issues. And what's so interesting about this range of movement that we've seen with closing the digital divide, more importantly, is one, many of the people on this panel have interacted in some way or form over the last, you know, five to ten years. But more importantly, we're interacting as we're actually seeing what we consider here at Brookings a supply-demand equation meaning we're putting millions and billions of dollars if you actually add up all the money that's available across agency into infrastructure while simultaneously creating these levers for people to what I now call stay connected, not just get connected, but to stay connected and to make those investments worthwhile. So this conversation is important because as of the end of June, we're going to start seeing some of these investments take place and right now, with the millions of people that are now connected through the Affordable Connectivity Program, which we're going to talk about today, what does that mean for the future? And what does that mean potentially in an environment where it could expire because of the lack of part, uh, you know, political reappropriation? But more importantly, it could expire because we run out of money. <laughs> And we run out of money while we're actually developing these infrastructure assets. So I thought it was my turn to have this conversation along with many people who are concerned not just about the networks, but the people at the center of the networks. And I'm really excited to be surrounded by some friends who I know are doing some really great work in this area. So first and foremost, thank all of you for coming today. So we give you a round of applause for showing up. Thank you. I feel like a Baptist preacher. I just had to give a sermon on why I was doing this. Let me first go to introducing who's here, and then we're going to jump right into the conversation because we have a second panel. Um, right next to me is my friend, Catherine DeWitt. She's no stranger to this. Uh, I used to think I showed up at every panel. She shows up every panel. Uh, she's the project director of the Broadband Access Initiative, the Pew Charitable Trust. I'm not going to tell you how long I've known Paul um, in this space, but Paul Garnett is chief executive Orf officer of the Vernonburg Group. Um, next to Paul is Mike O'Reilly, um, who I used to go before, who is a former commissioner at the Federal Communications Commission um, and now in his own uh, venture, and my dear friend, Dr. Fallon Wilson who is doing amazing stuff as the Vice President of Policy at the Multicultural Media and Telecom Internet Council, as well as in her other work when it comes to the Black Tech Initiative and other things that she's working on. Um, and she'll talk more about that when we get to her, just to give you a, a sense of that. So, Paul, I'm going to start with you. I'm just going to kind of jump in here, because this first panel is meant to sort of do some <coughs> landscaping with some stats. Tell us a little bit more about this program for people who may not be as familiar, where we are with enrollment, and, you know, just give us some basic stats in terms of where this program is rolling out successfully, et cetera. Okay, very good. Thank you very much for having me on this panel. Um, thanks, everyone, for showing up in person. It is actually pretty cool to be in front of real human beings. Um, and to age myself, when, when we met, I probably had some nice, bushy, you know. Uh, I just bought my hair. <laughs> light, light brown hair. <laughs> Look at me now. Not, not so good. Um, all right. So the Affordable Connectivity Program, for, uh, for those of you who may not, be, may not know that much about it, um, it was created under the um, 
the so-called Infrastructure Bill, or IIJA, the Infrastructure and Invest- Investment and Jobs Act, which uh, was passed into law toward the end of 2021. Um, and it appropriated four, $14.2 billion for, for the Affordable Connectivity Program. What the Affordable Connectivity Program does is it provides um, both service and device subsidies for qualified households. On the services side, it provides a $30 a month subsidy for, you, for a family to be able to afford Internet connectivity. If that family is located in a tribal area, that, that subsidy can be up to $75 a month. On the devices side, the program provides a device per household, um, so up to one device per household uh, to, to an eligible household, up to $100. And the device itself can't cost more than $150. So, so basically, the, the broadband provider would be charging the, the household between you know, $10 and $50 a month, uh, $50 for the device, and the remainder would be covered uh, through the program. It's primarily been a services program, so most of, most of the um, support under the Affordable Connectivity Program has gone toward uh, the, the provision of broadband services. Um, in terms of eligibility, it is generally a, a, a program that is um, for lower-income households. Um, so generally, if a, if a household is, is um, less than 200% of um, national poverty um, lines, um, and that depends on size of household and location, uh, they would be eligible for the Affordable Connectivity Program. It's not entirely income-based. So there are some federal programs, like, for example, Veterans Benefits, that would qualify for you for the ACP that are not income-based. But it is primarily a, um, a, an income-based program focused on, on lower-income households. So in total, about 38% of U.S. households, or about 48.6 million U.S. households, could sign up for the ACP. Now, in terms of um, participation itself... Um, about 38%, again, of eligible households have actually signed up for, for ACP benefits. Most broadband providers, at least the larger ones, have, have created a tier of service that essentially makes the service itself free for eligible households. So most broadband providers, the, you know, the, the brands that you're all, all familiar with, AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, Charter, others, they offer a $30 a month service package of at least 100 megabits per second of, of service, and that's $30 a month. So essentially, if you participate in the ACP, um, you're essentially able to get a, a, free, a free service. Um, in terms of where we are right now um, uh, in, in the program, um, as I said, $14.2 billion was appropriated. There was a predecessor program called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, um, and there was some money left over from that when, when um, the FCC rolled over into the new um, ACP program, and it ended up being about $2.9 billion, uh, which was, I think, more than what many of us expected. So, in effect, it created a $17 billion program. So it had more money in it than, than, uh, than was appropriated by, by, uh, by Congress. Um, but even there, money is being spent quickly. As I said, basically about 40% of households now are participating in, in the ACP. Um, and what that means is about f- almost $500 million is being spent every month on the ACP program. So we're sort of counting down the dollars. So as of, as of right now, you've got about $8 billion left in the Affordable Connectivity Program. Um, you know, at the same time, this is all being rolled out, and the, and the broadband providers are pushing hard for, to get folks to participate. The federal government is also promoting participation. So the FCC has two programs, um, grant programs, that, are, that provide grants to local community-based organizations to promote the ACP. And then likewise, NTIA, which, which administers something called the BEAD program, the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, um, is, is encouraging states to get um, uh, ISPs that participate in the, in the um, BEAD program to, to also um, uh, promote the Affordable Connectivity Program, and in fact is encouraging states to require all subgrantees to participate in the ACP. So at the same time, the, the, so the clock is winding down, participation is going up. Um, so at current projections uh, at that $500 million a month rate, uh, we're likely to run out of funding for the ACP sometime in the second half of next year. And, and of course, the, the irony is the better job we do at promoting it, the faster the money runs out. So so it could, be, it could be as early as, let's say, the middle of next year, or it could be as late as, let's say, December next year. It really depends on, on, uh, on program participation. 
So with, it, with that good news, I'm going to turn it back over to Nicole. <laughs> You're right. That's why we're doing this discussion. I mean, listen, my whole thing on this has been how do we pair the infrastructure investment with the subscription, right? And if you think about it, the people that we actually have uh, who are eligible for this program right now are eligible for a variety of social support programs. Or they're working class families in rural areas where this was actually something from the emergency broadband benefit that's keeping them on which is, again, I think such an important like analysis of how we pair these programs together, but I'm going to leave you all to talk about it because you know I have opinions. <laughs> um, so, Catherine, let me go over to you because in your work, you've been looking at like enrollment and participation by state, mm -hmm. which I think is critical as we think about these numbers that Paul is actually talking about. Give us a landscaping of the state participation. What does that look like? Where are people enrolling? Where are they not? That kind of stuff. Well, I think first... Uh Turn off that button. Okay. <laughs> you must be like my voice here. You're on TV. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so first, um, I think it's important to note that states are taking this seriously and capitalizing on a rare opportunity where they have both um, – they can pair policy requirements with uh, the necessary funding. And when we're talking about um, the supply and demand challenge uh, that Nicole mentioned, as well as the, um, the participation requirements that uh, NTIA is encouraging states to do, I also think it's important for us to note that uh, the Capital Projects Fund actually requires states uh, to uh, have their subgrantees participate in the ACP program. So what we're seeing now is a new approach to deployment, at least at the federal level, where they are factoring in um, this, uh, the notion that you not only have to connect all of those customers, unserved, underserved customers in an area, but you have to factor in those who may not offer as much of a business case at the front end. And the ACP provides a really important uh, tool for offsetting the costs of connecting those, uh, those households that may not present the initial ROI for providers. Um, and I think, you know, more specifically, states have been thinking about this approach for quite some time. Um, they recognize that... Um, you know, it, it, we do need to think differently about deployment moving forward for unserved and underserved. It's not just about the, the supposed mismatch between supply and demand. We do need to think about uh, the economics of deployment differently. We need to think about how to keep those folks online and reduce the risk for ISPs in the long term. Um, and I think like many of the researchers sitting up here and in the room and those who are practitioners as well, um, states also recognize that it takes more than the presence of a program to uh, increase participation and increase adoption. Just having it there is not enough. Uh, states know that they need a good ground game. Uh, they need a ground game that actually reflects local needs, and then they need partners to help them implement that. Um, and that's not just about the fact that state broadband offices are a little strapped for resources right now. They're a little busy. I'm not sure if you all know that they're responsible for administering quite a significant amount of federal funds right now. Um, but this also goes back to the research that a lot of folks, including my organization, have done for years, saying that you need those trusted partners on the ground. Um, I'm sure that uh, my colleague Fallon will be talking about that in a little bit. Um, but to that point of kind of how states are specifically addressing this, I wanted to offer a couple of examples uh, for how states are approaching ACP outreach and implementation. Um, you have states that are working on statewide partnerships with national organizations like Education Superhighway. Uh, those are states like Georgia, Delaware, and Colorado. Some states are also working with state-based and local organizations to launch outreach campaigns. Um, the state of Oregon is working with the Oregon University, or University of Oregon, excuse me, Extension Centers. Um, and states like Massachusetts and Wisconsin are offering grants to organizations to help them with local outreach. Then you have states that are focusing, are they're developing dedicated efforts to decrease the barriers to enrollment. Um, Arizona has been working uh, with Common Sense Media and other local partners to establish tech enrollment hotlines. You have states like Missouri and Illinois that are dedicating specific funds for digital navigators. Um, finally, uh, what I think is important, too, is that we're seeing a shift in the political winds. Um, states are setting goals around adoption uh, and enrollment in the ACP. Um, states like Kansas and Maine are doing that as part of their universal access goals. But then you also have governors in states like Alabama, Texas, South Carolina, who are setting um, a 
public focus on enrollment in the ACP. And that may seem like, okay, like, why are we talking about this? They're politicians. Um, but that political focus and having governors in particular state uh, the importance and emphasis on ACP is really critical for driving broader support within the state. Um, so I think just in wrapping this yeah. up, um, you know, states are doing their part. And so now in D.C., we need to do ours. That's right. And we're gonna, I'm like so excited about the second panel because we're going to hear also these ground games, um, Dr. Wilson, that, you know, Catherine is also talking about, which is we've got federal. So we know what the federal appropriations are. We know how states are engaging. And by the way, we know that all states are engaging. Listen to the states that we just discussed. This is not a blue or red issue. This is everybody's issue, right? And... If you look at the numbers of ACP enrollment, we're seeing a lot of red state enrollment in terms of this program, which, you know, we're pointing out on the blog as well. But you're on the ground game, like boots on the ground, like running around everywhere, talking to local stakeholders about this. And I think it's really important to sort of understand from a research perspective what that looks like before we begin to hear from our second panel. How is it to engage local partners and where do they fit in this? And tell us a little bit about what you're doing with the black churches. Um, Thank you for having me. Um, I get to work with Black Churches for Digital Equity. And what that is, it came out of the emergency broadband benefit work where we decided to support the notion that we really needed the extension of an internet subsidy for communities. And so we know that historically black churches play a pivotal role in making sure that communities have access not only to like internet now, but also to housing, to um, many other types of social services and social impact work that our churches do. And so we literally work across 13 states. I know it's not all 50, but you know, we're, we're, we're going to scale to get there. Um, and we work to educate African-American church leaders who who are pivotal, once again, community anchor institutions in their cities on what digital equity is. And so it's not just about ACP for us. We see it as a larger holistic story on how do you build future for black communities. And it includes B, it includes DEA. It probably will include EDA tech hubs. You know, we, we know we just go in all the places right now. And so we educate them on the data. This is important, right? I think we often assume that community anchor institutions aren't able to understand data and they can't make decisions and, and those types of things. But the Microsoft data platform is one of the tools we use to educate them to see exactly what the disparities look like in their communities so they can begin developing a type of vernacular to tell their digital equity stories. And of course, we use Benton's, ACP, we use it all and we break it down so that they can then advocate at the state level and also at the national level. Level. We recently brought a group of our church leaders to D.C., and they told their ACP stories to a lot of congressional representatives. I think they love talking. That's one thing you don't have to worry about pastors. <laughs> pastors will tell a story. Um, but over the last two and a half years of working with this group, about 50 church leaders across the country, is that they understood the need. We didn't have to say that this is important for their communities because they experienced the pandemic. Um, but what they now see as leaders in their state broadband offices, either they occupy the task force that a state has set up or they are attending the listening sessions, they want to be more actively involved in particular, giving feedback on all the digital equity plans across the state um, that we're in. And so we see community anchor institutions like African American churches, temples, mosques, all as essential to the discussion of future and technology. And sometimes here at the national level, we don't think about faith-based institutions in this type of way, but they can be pivotal partners in translating this new world that we find ourselves in. Um, in addition to that, last year we inaugurated, I want to say that we were the first national nonprofit to do this, whether it was Civic Nation or not. I'm just saying I think we were the first to do a national ACP enrollment event across 10 states where we worked with 30 cities to help them enroll into the ACP. Um, and we provided many micro grants to our church leaders, and they held all types of events. Some held back to school, and you'll hear some of that um, from Naomi when she comes up here to speak, um, back to school events where they gave away backpacks and they signed up ACP events. Some had jazz back 
fall events, everyone had a different way that they thought about doing it. Some actually had classroom settings where they literally walked people step by step application, I mean, literally page by page, and they connected them. And then they had all the providers there, all of them, all of them, um, to be able to sign them up and connect them immediately. And so we're excited. We're going to do that again this year. And it's going to be great because we're working once again across 13 states. And we have funds from the FCC to do this mass enrollment in August. So look forward to seeing a lot of enrollment numbers bump up, which is why this conversation around like how do we address um, the lack of funding is super important for us. Yeah, and I think it's so important too. I mean, Fallon is underestimating this. I was a moderator for her very first sessions. And if you know churches, the first thing they said is, well, what is this program? And then pretty soon by like the third or fourth one I had moderated, they were talking about using the Sunday pulpit to enroll people in ACP. And this was very early on. And so I think that there's something to be said about that, particularly when we see how communities that are intersexually affected by place and, you know, income are actually seeing this program as a relevant uh, factor. And Paul and I know, many of us know for years, cost was an issue, but it was really, why do I need to get online? And I think the pandemic really showed people, this is why you have to get online. It was interesting listening to your churches talk about that. Right. Healthcare and health disparities and things like that. So we'll talk more about that as well, because I think that this is like a triage approach. Where we begin to think about this money. Um, now, Commissioner O'Reilly, <laughs> let me come to you though. And uh, we've had many years together speaking about this. Affordability has always been an issue for the FCC when it actually lays out the statute of universal communications access to our infrastructure. You're watching this now from the outside, and I'm just curious about what do you think, right, when you begin to see a program that has millions of subscribers, this much money coming out of the commission that is actually helping you to meet some of those goals? Well, well first of all, thanks for having me. I actually... I was trying to think back. I don't think I've ever done an event at Brookings before. Oh, really? No. I didn't uh, get you when you were a commissioner? No, I'm sorry. We might have, might this have, is a we, pay, this, I'm, I'm, I'm making it up, okay? <laughs> it's all good. I, I was trying to think, but I, I don't think so. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, look, at, as a conservative Republican, I'm happy to lend my voice to... That the, had nothing with, to no. do with you not doing a panel. I just want to make <laughs> sure. I'm happy to, to <laughs> lend my <laughs> voice... <laughs> to lend my voice to this program. And I have um, articulated that in a number of different ways to express why we should extend the life of ACP, as we talk, as Paul talked about the numbers and the funding going forward. Um, and I, I think, you know, if you believe that the Internet is an amazing tool, um, you know, used, if used properly, um, as I do, uh, then you want to make sure that as many people who want it have access to it. Um, and, and if you believe that there's a portion of, of our population uh, that will never, you know, won't be able to or can't afford, um, you know, based on the current circumstances and the financial challenges that, that Americans face and American families face, then we try to figure out how do we help those families. And so I look and try and figure out what's the best program, um, what's the best subsidy, what's the best structure that would help those families in need. Um, and I've lived through a number of different versions, and, 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 and both as a policymaker on Capitol Hill, as congressional staff for 20 years, and then at the FCC overseeing a number of programs. And I support the ACP because I think it's the best structure we've had to date to get to where we want to go. Um, it actually is, you know, the question that's posed, you know, can, can we have affordability without ACP? And the answer is maybe, uh, but not as efficiently or desirable means. This is the best mechanism we've had to date. But that doesn't make it perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it, 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 it deals with things. And, and you mentioned the question, the FCC, you know, kicking out the dollars. It's really coming from Congress. These are decisions that Congress made, and Congress kept a role in the equation. Importantly, I think, what makes it, you know, differential from other programs, mm -hmm. uh, and so important. So uh, I look at this and say, this is a valuable tool to help Americans that are in need. You mentioned it's both an R and a D issue. It's both a blue and a red issue. It's both urban and rural. It's, it's everywhere that, you know, populations are being uh, signed up uh, across the board um, because there are needs in, in so many different populations um, to, to get the broadband. You know, it is, in my opinion, and, and I've done the work through all the different research over the years. I've done my homework. Um, it is generally affordable for most Americans um, today, but there's going to be a por portion of population that is going to need help going forward. And we have to figure out, or we, as an outsider, um, I, I can give advice to policymakers on what, what is the best mechanism, what are the tools, what, are, what should the program look like. And I would say I like a lot of what ACP does, and I think it deserves additional funding. 
The second part of my message, though, is for those that are expecting the same type of support or the same type of funding level that we've had, you know, since the program was initiated in the IIJA, I think that might be a little aggressive. Um, you know, there, there is a different Congress, there's different makeup, there's different policymakers in charge, uh, and you have to figure out how do you deal with certain things. Paul mentioned about eligibility. I've heard different numbers about how many people in America are eligible. Um, it's probably not to the numbers, you know, probably not capable of sustaining 40% of America being eligible. That's, that's probably not sustainable for policymakers that I talk to on Capitol Hill. Uh, it, it's just not in the cards. Uh, so you got to figure out how do you deal with eligibility uh, and how do you deal with there are people who are trying to take advantage of the program. We, we, they're taking advantage of all the different programs. That's the nature of, of government programs. How do you tighten? How do you deal with it? Well, waste, fraud, and abuse is a very important aspect and needs to be addressed. Um, and so both those things are going to – but that doesn't, that doesn't conflict with the program overall because it's about tie, you know, dialing down certain pieces. Um, and, but the overall structure of the program, a subsidy program that goes direct you – know, it's basically a grant-making program – directly to the individual through the, through the provider um, is the most efficient mechanism we've had versus subsidizing uh, you know, the carriers themselves or the providers themselves and hoping that it trickles down. Um, and what I like about the program especially, and I know people don't, is that it has Congress stays involved in the equation. Nothing has kept a greater eye on efficiency over the years than Congress being involved. And I come from an institution two and a half years removed, that, that had oversight over USF, um, and, and at no time did we ever try and figure out, and I pushed really hard for this, how we could save money in USF. Um, how could we address the contribution factor where it would actually go down? How do we deal with the cost of overall programs? At no point did we lower those numbers. Did we make this, you know, those are hard decisions to make. Um, and, and so I, I would say that the Congress being involved is the only way that you can make sure the program is sustainable in my mind. Yeah, and I want to uh, pick that up. So really quick, I forgot to say this. If you're watching us online or you're here, please tweet ACP Future is our hashtag, and we'll be going to audience Q&A for this first panel. Those of you that are online, please submit your questions, um, as well as for those of you here, we'll have some microphones floating. Um, I want to stay on this point for a second, and I promise, because um, it will, it, it, we're going to be doing a future panel on the future of United Service, the Universal Service Fund. But I do want to speak about some of this partisan um, conversation. I mean, look, we just came out of a debt ceiling conversation where there were some compromises, and there were some compromises made against some of the pandemic funds, as you realize. And we're seeing some pushback, despite the numbers being both red and blue and independent, uh, from certain legislators who sort of see this program you know, not for what it's worth. You know, I always think about this, and, and I'm curious, uh, Mike, just to go to you first, and I want others to jump in. You know, when we talk about keeping people warm through the low-income housing energy assistance program, it's just no question that we never think about cutting that because it's a different type of service for people. You know what I mean? It's not, the pandemic showed us if you didn't have internet, you couldn't learn. You couldn't get health care. Um, I see, you know, rural areas could not, take advantage of opioid uh, mitigation and risk because of the, the time it took to go from a person's house and then come back and then retreat them. Is this something different that we need to be talking about, though, that this is really part of the vibrancy of keeping people connected to first-class residency here in the United States? Well, look, at I think every program... Um, you know, deserves appropriate scrutiny. Yes. Um, and so you mentioned LIHEAP. Yes. Um, I worked, you know, many years ago, I worked for a New England member from New Hampshire, uh, conservative, and they figured, you know, they supported LIHEAP, yes. and I, my job was to help the program. But there was constant uh, attack, yes. you know, yes. from both course, sides to try and figure out how yes. do you save, you know, it's a very difficult budget cycle we're in right now. We are $31 trillion in debt, yes. uh, and we're trying to figure out, you know, and, and this panel is basically asking, and that's, you know, some of, I'm, I'm asking them to spend more money. Um, and so you You've, you've got a balance set of how much you're asking them to spend um, and, and, and how does that go around with the overall equation. So I think every program deserves the appropriate scrutiny. Yeah. Um, I believe this program can be defended. People ask me you know, all the time, you know, can you prove that the people wouldn't, be, you know, wouldn't have gotten access otherwise? Well, I don't, I don't think that's fair from a one-year-old program. Right. I, right. I don't think that's fair. We still have problems in proving a number of universal service programs, and I'm happy to join your panel if you have one uh, on USF. Yeah, it's okay. coming. I'll be, I'll be back. Um, so, so there are a lot of difficulties there so that it's important to do and so I, I think that this is not getting undue scrutiny but it is going to get appropriate level of, of review before additional dollars are made available yeah no I think it's fair others that want to just chime in Paul um, yeah I mean I've always, I've always loved the idea of, of um, 
universal service or these kinds of programs being much more consumer oriented. Yes. Um, and I think one of the great things about the ACP is it's, it's ultimately the consumer's choice as to whether they participate in it in the first place. It is targeted to lower income households. Um, and it is, it is pretty deregulatory actually. Um, so the, there's no, there's no definition, for example, of broadband in the, in, in the ACP, it's internet service. So, you know, the, the broadband providers, you know, with, you know, some negotiation with the White House came up with the, you know, 100 megabit per second throughputs that they would all sign up for, for, for the ACP, but there was nothing in the statute that required it. Um, uh, and, and so I think it's actually, a, it's, it's, it targets the support in, in, a, in a way that makes a lot of sense. It, it limits it to, to the folks who need the help the most, and it actually is pretty deregulatory. Um, and, uh, and also, just personally, I've always liked the idea of shifting responsibility to paying for universal service programs to Congress um, and out of this whole universal service contribution mess we've been in for, you know, back when I was at the FCC in 2000, I, I was involved in the first universal service contribution NOI, which is crazy. You think about that, 23 years ago, and we haven't solved this. So, so I think that tells you something uh, about, about the problem. So, yeah, so I, yeah, all, all of those And, and it demystifies it to tell you the truth, the thing that I always think about as well, that this is a program just for big companies, right? There are small and mid-sized providers that are equally providing and, and contributing to the ACP in ways where they're pushing it out to their subscribers. I mean, listen... Catherine, I worry because if this if this program runs out of money, expires, gets caught up in a political logjam, what do we do with you know fifteen million upward, ninety million people that are subscribed that now have to choose between broadband and bread? I mean, listen, my book is coming out in January. I talked to a lot of those people. You know, during the pandemic, there were school teachers that told me the tablets that they sent home with their kids in rural Alabama were like books without paper. Like these are real experiences that people had. I'm going to hear from some of my friends on the second panel. But what do we do, particularly in areas we have this economic fragility when it comes to being able to take advantage of the new digital economy? I know that's a big question. question. (laughs) Uh, So I, I think... I think let's let's level set here on a couple of points. One, enrollment is high both in urban and rural uh, regions. Um, additionally, you mentioned this earlier, but polling shows strong bipartisan support for ACP among voters. That 78% of voters are in favor of continuing support to ACP. That 70% of independents as well as 64% of Republicans. You have states that are majority rural, ranging from Missouri, Alabama, Louisiana, Maine, Vermont, who are investing funds and directing resources to support enrollment in ACP, much like they did in EBB. These are the same states who were standing up broadband offices and digital equity initiatives before the pandemic because they were saying one thing, without access to broadband, our rural towns are dying. That's economic opportunity, that's access to education, that's business attraction, that's health care, you name it. That's why these states who have to have balanced budgets, unlike our colleagues elsewhere, that's why they were directing funds to solving this problem. And so I just listed a bunch of majority rural states, but I think it's important for us to take a step back and look at the commonalities for the communities that are not are either unconnected or underconnected. This isn't an urban or urban or rural problem. This is a low income problem. So the more that we can, again, balance balance the finances of these uh, deployments, think about removing risk for ISPs and removing uncertainty for customer rollover and customer retention in the long run, the less uh, likelihood we'll have of repeating the, uh, what was the B, the saying of the criticism of BTOP, networks to nowhere? <coughs> yeah, you know, I was actually, um, this is where I will age myself. I was the top participant, a BTOP participant one and two. I've been around, as Tupac would say. Listen, <laughs> Khaled, I want to come to you, though, because we've got a rural issue, but I think also, I think we also diminish the urban side of it, too, right, um, in terms of, so I would love, like, to balance it for this conversation as well, because there is a belief, well, if you live in a city, you have more opportunity. Uh, if you're in a place where you have all these anchor institutions that could be very helpful and supportive, those kids in Los Angeles County, for example, were able to go to the fast food restaurants or their churches. Why is this equally important to continue this conversation for local communities, particularly communities of color? I'm, I mean, it's essential. Um, I can't talk about future 
can't talk about AI if we're not talking about level setting around internet access for communities of color. Um, to me, there is no digital equity without racial equity in this country, right? And so be making sure that we are able to level set that is both a urban and a rural issue is super important here. I, and honestly, I think people outside of D.C. in the Beltway get this. We work with state broadband offices in Georgia, in Florida, in Texas, these beautiful states. I'm a Texan. Let me just say that. Um, where they don't say digital equity, they say digital opportunities, right? It's part of their, their vernacular there. Um, but they get the notion that we want to make sure that we're addressing all types of regional geographics within our, within our state. And also, ACP is such a great issue. Everyone loves it at the local level. I'm often fascinated that when I get into the D.C. conversations here or having to talk with people on the Hill, it becomes a partisan conversation when at the local level, people get it and see it as a larger play for a larger type of plan for their state or for their municipality. And in particular... I, you know, I always want to talk about, I know we're talking about internet access, but I always got to throw in devices too for black and brown people. I think we overlook that piece. We're going to connect all of our communities, but they don't have computers in their homes. So how do you expect for them to work alongside machines, be with machines, and have this amazing program um, without actually having computers to really adopt the internet? But I'm just going to drop that there. Eventually, we're going to all, as a country, come back to this and be like, oh my gosh, everyone's connected, but they're not used. Oh my God, they need computers tablets are flint no i'm joking i love tablets let me technology neutral in this conversation um but overall i think it is essential that african-american churches and other nonprofit leaders who are doing great work i know eventually you want to get to the the comment about where should acp be situated at the municipal level and i'm, and I'm jumping your conversation no you can talk about it because i'm going to after you're done i'm going to just turn it over to michael riley <laughs> oh well perfect um part of one of the questions that nicole gave and it, it connects to the urban conversation more more specifically is like where should acp offices be located should it be located in its at a municipal level or at the state level should it be in social services? And I kind of take a middle ground approach to it, especially for urban communities. Um, I think it should be, I think we have to create new offices completely. I know, like a digital inclusion office at the state and the municipal level. Um, ITS doesn't understand forward-facing community. Um, they are technical. I mean, they're great people. Don't get me wrong. They can connect you. They can fiber you. They can do these things. But they don't understand the complexities of a mother who has two children um, at MNPS, and she's trying to figure out how to get tablets and devices to her kids and her community and her children. They're not good with that type of language in our community building. I would say, people say, well, put it in the social service and the social um, impact um, departments at the state or the municipal level, but they don't understand technical. They may not even have internet in their agencies or off if we're going to be honest about this, right? And so I think part of the challenge and part of the national discussion and the local discussion, I, and I think states are thinking about this as they create their digital equity plans, having to create like digital inclusion offices where you have this intersection of both the technical and the community facing piece of this, um, especially for urban and, and also rural communities so that you can have adoption and impact and also have devices and connectivity. Um, so I'm going to drop that there. I, um, people may disagree, but I don't think our current agencies and departments are built yet for this level of like intersectionality that we need. Yeah, I have so many questions. And again, if you all have questions, I'm going to be coming out to the audiences shortly. So Commissioner, what do you think? I mean, is the FCC, I think Fallon has laid out a couple of options of where this program could potentially live a longer life. Should it stay at the commission? I've actually got some thoughts based on this conversation, too, that I might change up a little bit. With respect, I'm not sure it's about creating new offices. And I, I, I just, yeah, yeah. Look, I'm not a policymaker anymore. <laughs> um, so I leave that to, to Congress to decide. But my recommendation, my thoughts are the FCC is not well suited for this. And, and, and for those of you who follow the FCC, they know they're not necessarily making the decisions. They farm that out to USAC. Mm -hmm. USAC does the back end. Um, you know, and it is a quasi government organization, a quasi private organization that has real. No I've had a lot of problems with the USAC structure and how it's dis you know detached from FCC decision making. So I, I, I personally would say that that it's a better place that you could do a lot of different opportunities uh, and where it should go. People talk about social services offices that already exist. I I'm open to what's the best 
you know, mechanism for distributing uh, resources when you figure out what's the right eligibility level, when you figure out how much money you're talking about, when you do some of the other components. So, but I don't think the FCC is well suited for some of these things. They can certainly add uh, their technical advice on the policy components, and they certainly can advocate um, and as, as come up a couple times, I certainly favor tech neutrality yeah. and not picking one broadband mm-hmm. type service over another. And so I think there's, there's flavors of, of that that can come through. And the, the FCC can be advisable uh, or, or provide great uh, insight on those things. But I'm not sure it's where exactly I would see as a social dis- distribution mechanism. Mm-hmm. And let me just put a caveat here. Fallon was talking about the state and the municipal level. You were asking about the federal level. I think that's a very complex discussion. And I do think that within the FCC, let me just say that there are good people doing a lot of great work at this very moment. I cannot imagine being able to educate and and work with like 13 states and 30 cities without the help of the federal communications helping us with the application, trying to figure out ways around the ways that they built the application, right, to help us to be able to get people enrolled. And so I do think, to your point, there's a conversation that needs to be had here. But it's the best we got at this moment. I think we should try to think through. But at the state and municipal level, I believe in new offices all around. Uh-huh. Yeah, Go ahead, I, Paul. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't. I also don't have an opinion on whether the FCC or someone else in the, at the federal level should be administering this. But I, I wanted just to second your point on the importance of having digital equity offices, and you know, obviously at the state level, the municipal level, to the extent that the government has the has the resources right. to set to create one up and you know set one up and you know, hire someone who's, who's responsible for that. Um, even if, even if they cannot afford to hire an individual or set up an office, at least make someone responsible for, for this. It's part of their job. It's part of their, you know, their annual review as something in there about right. digital equity and they're responsible for actually making sure this, this stuff all gets done. Um, and then the other point is, is, you know, it, to the extent there are different roles in government, it is extremely important that they all work with each other because, because right. there is, there is intersection. I mean, the, the same, the same folks who, who are likely to be on the wrong side of the digital divide also mm-hmm. are folks who, who, who are, are experiencing education gaps or healthcare care gaps and, and housing gaps and other issues. So the more that within government we can all be talking to each other and coordinating these activities, the better. Did you want to say something on this? No. no. Okay. <laughs> I had to ask. Actually, yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> I think that they, I, I agree. I, I think what's, I'm listening to everybody and I'm kind of processing in real time here a couple of things um, that may be worth elevating for a future panel, just yeah. for you. Yeah. Um, we are really talking about a different way of thinking. Like, we're talking now about rolling programs into existing initiatives, existing offices, agencies. I think what this really speaks to is you know, we need to have a larger national discussion around universal access. What does that mean? How does it affect the way that we offer um, government services and community services across the country? And what is our strategy for getting there? And also helping agencies adapt to this type of service delivery in in a tech-based environment. And that means that likely also comes with funding. Um, So ACP needs to be the priority, but I think that this is a subset of a much larger larger conversation around what our um, strategy is as a country. Um, and how we define roles for every level of government. Thank you for saying that, because I completely agree, um, when it comes to achieving that strategy. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I write about that, but I think, <laughs> I do. And, you know, but I think it comes to this conversation, you know, for this next panel on what does the future of universal service look like in this country? So clearly that, because we are running parallel programs uh, with this ACP program that we have. But as I thought about it, and then I'm going to kind of push back on my own idea, to a certain extent, this program, this is my last question, and I'm going to let y'all come in, okay? So we need some questions from you. This program is also being driven by companies who are obliged to the FCC, right? So a lot of the low-income programs that are developed are coming from providers who have some quality standards, you know, that the FCC is also paying attention to. And so there's a part of me that says this is not a typical SNAP program, right? This is a program that, if done right, has potential, like I said earlier, to keep people connected versus giving them a one-time service. And when we keep people connected, we do better as a global, globally because we have a more competitive uh, ecosystem. So I'm just curious, President Biden and others did this with AI, where they actually went through agency by agency to do an audit of how they were addressing AI issues. Do we need something like this on digital equity first? 
And then two, should we keep it in the FCC so we can ensure that the people who are benefiting from these programs also get the best of the internet too? as we see more complicated technologies come. I know that was a very academic question, very think tankish. I will um, divide it out. But one, should we be doing this accounting and auditing of our government agencies to make sure digital equity is part of the conversation, which I think could get to Fallon's point. You can answer, you don't have to. But then two, should we keep it in the FCC so we ensure that the companies continue to evolve the program where technology is going? Yep. Oh. I mean, Go ahead, Commissioner. Sure. I'll, well, look, I, I think it's there's two parts to that, right? I mean, well, you asked the question on, on how to distribute the funding, and I was suggesting maybe that wasn't an FCC component, right. but maybe there are some others that, that should, should do that. Um, and and then I still believe that, and you know, compared to a couple minutes ago, so so I'm still sticking to my to my guns here. I was the only one that backpedaled on mine. <laughs> yeah. So so I still believe there's that you know on the front end, but I don't know that necessarily it was the FCC. They have standards in terms of how things are yes. you know defined, and those things can still be you know, and the FCC can still play a role in that component. Um, I think our panelists have highlighted how some of the conditions of you know uh, provider participation developed um, you know through through the administration through mechanisms so so you can still have that um, and, and I think you can still have that umbrella structure with the FCC participating in that if you want to have someone else do the distribution side of the equation I don't think that causes you know doesn't disrupt the overall process doesn't undermine that you're going to get an inferior broadband product uh, to, to those, those populations so I think you can have both uh, without having to have them all within the FCC right now yeah that's that's maybe where I was going with this to make sure that it was somewhat distributed particularly as we think about where we're going with the expiration of the funds etc could be an interesting way to look at how we actually talk about but I agree with your point on audit yeah. they absolutely have to continue Continue to review these programs from top to bottom, yeah. which doesn't isn't happening today enough on, on existing USF programs and right. uh, the work that I used to do. Yeah, and, and it's like, like you said, it's a year program, so I think it takes time for us to even see. I mean, in my lifetime, I haven't seen anything like this, um, and I've been involved with a lot of partnership programs over the years where we've partnered with local communities, etc. The key thing is, after a year, how do we continue to improve upon the program? Okay. Well, can- can I say? Oh, go can, ahead. I, I, wait, just one thing. If you have a question, just raise your hand, because if not, you're not going to get in. <laughs> so make sure you raise your hand and we'll get a mic. Go ahead. Dr. I just want to answer the first part of your question and go back to something Catherine said. I, it's, it's, very, it's a great experiment that we're doing in the country now between right. BDA and all of the amazing work that's happening. States are literally creating digital equity plans to say how they're going to level the playing field so that we have, like, competitive advantage ultimately in this country, Right. I think there's something to be said about, and I mean, you may not have meant this, but I'm going to go there anyway. Um, the agencies having to think about digital equity. Yes. I would love for, you know, of course, USDA to think about digital equity. I want the Social Service Administration digital equity. I would love the notion that every major department and agency in our country has to go through some type of audit to see how it's affecting their clients, the ways that they operate. And I think it, it would help us if nationally we had a, a, a level setting as well so that when the states get their lives together, our, our, the national government will be together too when it comes to understanding exactly how we move forward. Because it's interesting, there's so much funding that shifts. I just want us to be able to have a national discussion about how leveling the playing field with BEAD and DEA can support the CHIPS Act. I would love to have a national narrative on how all of that looks because technically it's all seeding into the same direction, but I don't think there's been a combined discussion on exactly how we get there. Were you in my uh, office the other day? Was I? <laughs> I was a book on your But you're shelf. right. We'll come back to that if we have time, but I love that. Okay, we're going to go to questions right now. We'll go to this young man right here, and then I have a question up here in front. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Roger Cochetti, and I'm an author of a couple of textbooks on the history of satellite communications and an editorial contributor to on technology policy to the Hill newspaper. I have two questions that really <clears throat> may overlap with the next panel but are, are larger trends. The first is that I am probably the only person in this room and certainly one of the few people on the East Coast of the United States who still has a landline telephone connection. Most people laugh at me yeah. when I tell them that. But you I, actually do. My mother just got rid of hers. <laughs> and I can assure you that I get an average of six spam calls a month, and in the last two years I've gotten probably two real telephone calls. The history of universal service and this whole discussion is based on the 1950s concept of 
of wires being strung along streets connecting to people's houses. And it, that's a very high cost structure which leads to the need to subsidize. Are we reaching the point, and I think we're now well, over 50% of American households do not have landline, are we reaching the point where we should forcibly, maybe too strong a term, but aggressively disconnect or stop spending money on landline telephone services that are overwhelmingly used for spam and put that money into internet services, which is what people are obviously interested in. Second question, which is related to it, is that in the past 10 or 15 years, the cost of satellite communications has dropped by, take your pick your figure, but I would say about 90%. And one of the distinctive things about a satellite wireless connection is that you can amortize that 10% cost left, not over, not just over the 50 people in this town, you can amortize that cost over 500 million people from India, 800 million people from China, uh, 700 million people from Africa, and thus the unit cost drops to pennies f for a connection. And keep in mind that the one uh, roadblock to satellite communications that has always been the case is this big equipment. And later this year, we're going to see the first generation of smartphones that are usable for satellite communications. So if you put these all together and look forward a few years, we reach the day when satellite communications, broad, satellite broadband costs a dollar, cost, not priced, but cost a dollar a month per user. How, how does this fit into the overall equation? So two, two broad questions. Thank Anybody you. Anybody want to answer? Go ahead, Paul. Well, I, can, I, could just, I mean, I think it's, I mean, that all, that all sounds great. My, my father lives in northeastern Vermont and has only telephone service as well um, and is still on dial-up. Um, so I think, I think, unfortunately, there are enough Americans who are still, still on copper. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, you know it, there's always this, you know, things always take longer than we think they will, right? And, and unfortunately, we're still stuck with several million people in the U.S. who still have telephone, you know, copper-based telephone lines, um, and they will for, for some time in the future. Um, and then there are also obviously some applications that still rely on <clears throat> on those telephone lines, like alarm systems, uh, which a lot, again, a lot of people in rural America rely upon to protect their property. Um, <clears throat> and then on the satellite point, again, I mean, I think, um, yeah, that's great. It's all coming. Um, and in some ways, it's already here. Um, and, um, you know, the faster the better. But again, there's always this difference between when technology gets created and when it gets sort of ma where mass adoption actually occurs. So unfortunately, I think we have to wait longer for, for these things to sort of come to to be mainstream. Can I, uh, just adding a point, you made, you said something about price versus cost. And I think that that's also a discussion that we need to do a better job at, um, particularly those who work in the research and policy practitioner space, distinguishing between um, uh, cost for low-income households and price and affordability overall for consumers. And I, I think we've reached an inflection point in folks understanding the distinction between those two things. Um, and being very deliberate about making the distinction between those two things. Uh, but I think in order for us to uh, develop policy that uh, supports, again, the universal access, but also a greater consumption of the of Internet in general, we need to do a much better job at distinguishing between um, affordability for low-income households versus um, affordability and price for all. Yeah, I'll add, uh, look at most of the programs the FCC runs certainly have migrated to supporting broadband and, and don't, you know, directly focus on copper networks. Um, they still have, you know, most of the programs have a requirement um, for a voice component, which I, I tried to get rid of. I didn't think that was a necessity uh, for for the for the off for the subsidies and how the dollars were distributed. Um, we'll see if that gets changed because it's really distributing. It's really distorting. Excuse me. Um, how those how the dollars are going out. But to your second point, I'm actually a huge fan of satellite technology. As I am, I'm, I'm a technology neutral guy. Um, it's, I represent a lot of people in, in this space, and so I don't pick one or the other. But I like 
what, where satellite is going. I was, you know, I advocated that, you know, for instance, in RDOF, um, I advocated that SpaceX not be precluded from the front end of the consideration. They are eventually precluded on the back end, and I wasn't there when it was, so I don't know how that application was considered, but I didn't think it should be blocked from the beginning point, uh, and I think I was right on that. And, and eventually, I'm, I'm really excited on where we're going to, where it's going to go, um, what we're going to see from Amazon, uh, second full-on, you know, competitor uh, for, little, uh, for, for a Leo system. I'm really excited when they can bring their price, we talk about price, uh, when they bring the price point um, of, their, or of their device and what, what they're able to do. So I think satellite has a huge component and will play a big role in, if we talk about universal connectivity, um, certainly there's going to be a portion of population in my mind um, that is not going to have connectivity despite all of the dollars that are going for bead or going out for um, access. There's going to be a portion that's still um, going to have to be addressed and I think satellite actually will provide a wonderful technology. It's not inferior. I think it actually will be a wonderful technology um, for the most rural parts uh, of America where they don't necessarily need alarm systems uh, because their nearest home, nearest neighbors, you know, miles and hundreds of miles away. Right. Well, I, I would just say, just to add on that, I mean, I think obviously the, the stories of people still relying on copper is real, right? There are still communities that need a phone line to be able to access emergency communications, doctors, family members, and friends. And we've seen a slow progression of the retirement of copper and, and regular analog lines as a result of that. But I do think on satellite, it's interesting. Satellite is promise. I think when you're technology neutral and you look at all the ways in which you can bring broadband in, hybrid models of 5G, satellite, et cetera, the challenge is the device affordability at the end of the day. And I think this ongoing monthly subscription to services is something we still have to test in marketplaces where people are still on the wrong side of digital opportunity. Because as with any technology, and this is kind of goes back to what Fallon said, devices matter. And so when you begin to migrate people onto new platforms, new technological platforms, it has a new device. Can people who are already struggling to pay a monthly service be able to afford those things as well? So I think what we're seeing in the marketplace, as Mike has talked about and Paul and Catherine, is eventually we're going to see, just like we saw with broadband, new technologies enter the market that will begin over time. I don't know if you remember how high broadband was after when it was first introduced. The price points continue to go down, and we'll see that as new technologies enter the marketplace. Uh, but we still have to be sensitive to the fact that not everybody can even afford basic service at this time. So thank you for those questions. Um, okay, I have a question right here. We'll try to be shorter. If this other person has a question, we'll get one more in before we transit to the next panel. Uh, well, thank you so much for the incredible panel. My name is Ruben Roy. Um, I just graduated with a bachelor's degree in computer science from George Washington University. Thank you. Thanks. Congratulations. Yeah. And I'm a former intern at both the FCC and Microsoft. Um, and so my question for the panel is more on the implementation lens of ACP. Um, my question is, from a deployment perspective, how, what it looks like for ACP specifically for communities that are either non-English speaking or English as a second language, and how that implementation looks like uh, specifically from sort of a linguistically and culturally inclusive perspective. I, no, go ahead. Yeah. Well, part of the work that we do with black churches for digital equity, we have a lot of churches that we work with in Houston, Texas, um, and many of their congregations are are multilingual. And so part of the work that we had to do there is to work with so many of our national partners here in DC to connect us with um, Latinx and other communities that could help us to make sure we can translate, number one, the application process, but also to make sure, and the FCC was good about this, they sent us applications in different languages so that we can also do enrollment there. I think having, once again, community anchor institutions who are trusted, who can work across various regions and various communities is super important. And so that's how we approach it to make sure that we are aligned. And, and, and our church leaders, once again, they may be African-American churches, but they serve all types of racial and ethnic groups with, through their social impact ministries. And so connecting, working with HTTP was probably our main point of contact to make sure that we had languages, at least when it came to our Latino communities. Can I just add to this um, briefly? I think Fallon really hit it on the head. We haven't talked much about enforcement 
um, and particularly when it comes to implementation requirements and statutory requirements. And I think we need to do a better job of tracking um, how implementation is going. Um, Senators Cruz and Thune made great points in some of the uh, questions that they elevated around what data are we collecting around the ACP. But now we have statutory requirements in place about reaching those communities who have been historically marginalized, about making sure that we're offering these services in more than English. So we need to do a better job in holding our public, um, our agencies and public leaders accountable to those requirements to ensure that we are thinking about those communities who are English as a second language. Um, and I think we need to have a better discussion about also how we can do that in a way that doesn't overly burden those communities um, and uh, can do it in a culturally sensitive way. Right. I would just add just a couple of quick points there. I mean, all, all of the broadband providers I work with are doing a lot in this space and, and they're incentivized and mm -hmm. to, to reach out to all kinds of different populations, whether they're, whether English is a first language or English is a second language, immigrant, um, undocumented, unhoused, um, they, 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 they really are doing a lot of that work uh, already. Um, and then uh, the other thing to add is with the, with the implementation of, um, of BEAD and the Digital Equity uh, Act, um, there are requirements for uh, st the states as the eligible entities as well as the subgrantees to be thinking about underrepresented communities and covered populations inclusive of all, all the groups that you just mentioned. Um, and then lastly, I think just, you know, to your points earlier, community-based organizations are so critical to all of this. One of the things we've talked about is you've got to go local, you've got to rely on community-based organizations to sort of be your boots on the ground to actually do the, the sort of delivery and, and touching all these different populations to, to get them to, to get to higher rates of, of adoption of broadband and technology. And I would also say there are a lot of national organizations from NDIA to others who are holding convening so that there's cross conversations to ensure that we capture all communities irrespective of language and where they're located. So listen. I, oh, thank you. I turned it off by accident. I'd love to actually continue this conversation. But the only thing is I got to get to a second panel. I got to give them some time. So save your questions. Okay. But I wanted to say to this um, young man, first of all, thank you for asking that question. But two, what I, what I actually tried to do in the second panel and what I've done in watching the FCC broadband outreach program is that they are actually funding disability community and they are funding Spanish-speaking Spanish communities um, in ways that are not always visible to the people that sit in this room. So I want to actually give that shout. There were several I reached out to to find out what they were doing as I was thinking about this uh, panel. But I think what is most important before we say goodbye to this panel is that there is this correlation between supply and demand. At the end of the day, we tend to historically make all of the affordability problems part of like a social service initiative. But in reality, the assets that we're building and where technology is going means that this is equally critical to ensure that people not only get online, but stay online. Um, and that for me is a structural concern that is going to make a difference for someone who has a health disparity to someone who just needs to get online to speak to an aging parent or to communicate in a very topographically distant community like Garrett County who needs to sort of stay involved with their family members and friends. So that's why we have the second panel because you're going to hear what people are actually doing. But first and foremost, let's give this panel a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Now, I guess I get to sit here and stay glued to the seat, but I might need some help uh, with this microphone to make sure it's working. So if I can get somebody from my team just to come up. And I'm going to call up the next panel. Here, can I give you this microphone? Either I turned it off or it's not working. And so I have this, this thing to be like the family food, right? Oh, I get to move over. Oh, man, I got to get up. Okay. <laughs> All right, perfect. Um, and we're actually bringing in somebody online as well. Let me introduce, this is the one that's not working today. We were on that issue, but I can't get that one on. Okay. All right. So let me introduce the second panel. Please, as we're talking, please grab a lunch if you haven't already, because we've got one more panel, and we want to make sure that you eat and the food doesn't go to waste as well. Our next panel in, hey, Tracy, how are you, <laughs> is... Um, going to answer, I think, the questions of that last conversation around who is actually benefiting. And on the panel, we have Michael Collins, who is Vice President of Housing and Financial Capability at the National Urban League. 
we have Naomi Jordan Cook, who is the co-founder, a virtual global consultant, and a member of the Black Churches for Digital Equity Coalition. We have Michael Culp, who uh, he's going to be Mike and you're going to be Michael, who is the director of broadband accessibility and affordability in Albemarle County in rural Virginia. And my friend Tracy Morris, who joins us through the television screen here, um, who is the director of the American Indian Policy Institute at Arizona State University. So let's welcome all these folks as well. All right. So let's jump into this. You had a chance to hear this, like, you know, structural boots on the ground at the federal level when it comes to policy. I'm curious, uh, first and foremost, and let's go to Mike first, to hear about what you're doing, Michael, Mike, right? You got it. You got it. <laughs> on the local level in Albemarle County, right? So right. I think there were a lot of things that you heard that, in particular, the state of Virginia is sort of taking on as an initiative, not just the county, right? Yeah. And I'm just curious to hear a little bit more about what you're doing and what you've been able to sort of make sense of in this conversation around ACP and its, its sustainability. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, everybody, for staying around. I really appreciate being on this stage with these wonderful people. It's great to be in front of people who are alive and smiling, so keep those smiles coming. Uh, a lot of work ahead. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Albemarle County is a mostly rural county. We're the home of the University of Virginia, Go Wahoos, and we also have the city of Charlottesville, um, which is right, right in the middle of the county. So we're mostly rural. Um, we have some affluency, uh, admittedly, uh, but we have pockets of poverty, intergenerational poverty, and especially in our urban areas, we're, we're seeing a lot of migration into the areas to take on those retail jobs, and a lot of people are underemployed. So there's a, a big issue with people not having valuable jobs that can pay their bills, and it's just a cycle that those same people are bringing their children up into that same situation without access to great devices and the internet, it's, it's making it very difficult for them to contribute in meaningful ways to the digital world. Um, we, we are fortunate. Uh, we've done a lot of access work. So we have a number of fiber providers, both in the development and in the rural areas, six of them to be exact. And they're all currently working on projects. So we've, we've got a lot of activity that's going on. Um, but we, we're shifting to where affordability is a, is a big issue. And one of the ways that the ACP has helped is that it's brought that revenue source to not only our major national providers, but also to the smaller, the smaller Internet service providers. So it's, it's a cottage industry of locals who have been doing fiber for a while, but it's giving them an opportunity to, to keep things going. Um, one of the ways that we're seeing that happen is with uh, multiple dwelling units, the MDUs, whether they're apartment complexes or low-income condominium-type work. We see a, a great opportunity to get involved with those areas and, and begin to promote digital equity through digital skills. So it's not enough just to have the Internet. You've got to be able to get out into that community and meet them where they are and provide them with digital skills training. So that, that's our next big step. Um, so we, uh, we really see it as a, as, as a boon for the, the next generation of digital workers. Right. And that area, to your point, my son is a UVA student. When you drive down there, it does go through pockets. It's so interesting, just, you know, not too far from uh, Fairfax County and where you are in terms of Virginia itself. Naomi, you've heard Fallon talk a lot about your initiative, the Black Churches for Digital Equity. I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you're doing in that initiative, how digital, what digital equity means for you, right, uh, particularly for where you're located in New York. Um, so first, um, I have people watching, and you know, being a church member, I got to shout out my church, which is Zoe Ministries. And uh, one of the things that I'm happy to say is that Zoe Ministries, we have the privilege, um, and I say with, with grace and humility, of having a privilege of being completely virtual, where we're now using our church buildings for other church leaders to be able to worship. Um, when it comes to the digital divide, which is no stranger, we've seen it, especially during the pandemic, and even in even in our churches of how, you know, single parent households where they were literally sharing a device, you know, sharing a device to do homework and to do work. Um, you know, I think of Mother Johnson, who, you know, was trying to do worship 
and Sunday worship or Bible study online. And she's like, oh, my daughter, she, she going to get me connected. <laughs> or what's going on? It's keep dropping. I'm on Facebook Zoom. And, you know, you're like, wait, wait, what, what are you doing? And she's using a phone device. Um, you know, when I think about in Harlem, the different youth centers that doesn't have um, computer science and digital literacy that is going on, that, that this is government funding, but yet and still they're not connected to have access access to the internet. You know, it's no stranger that, you know, America, 29% of black people do not have access to the internet. And we need to find a way to close that and to go beyond. We need to be able to have devices, not just one, but devices, proper devices in their home. We need to be able to uh, making sure that we're, we're giving literacy and showing um, our elders and, and those that are coming up how to properly use the technology. And also um, providing, you know, AI skills and virtual reality skills and, you know, expanding their minds to the next level when it comes to our youth. Yeah, it's so interesting. When I when we started talking about this years ago, I would have never thought we'd been talking about AI and the digital divide. It's just an interesting evolution. So thank you for sharing that. Now, Michael, at the National Urban League, you all are focused similarly on digital disparities. This time you're doing a lot of work around housing, wealth building, economic sustainability. What does it mean to a community when they have seamless and affordable access to technology? And what I loved about this invitation that I made to you is around these, these communities, ecosystems, mm -hmm. right? Where the technology finds a space and how is important is it to have the devices to connect, much like we've heard from Naomi. Absolutely, so uh, I wanna provide a little bit of context. The National Urban League uh, has about 96 affiliates uh, across 36 states, including, the Was including Washington, D.C. And our goal is really how do we connect those who are underserved to the economic mainstream? How do we support them in gaining economic empowerment? And we do so by working across five issues, jobs, housing, health, justice. I lift this because this issue is one that cross cuts all of those. And we are committed to ensuring that our communities and constituents we serve um, are able to take advantage of this opportunity. When we talk about access, uh, we really are focusing on building a strategy that takes into account not only community readiness, but also uh, institutional efficiencies. Um, it's really trusted partners within community, these ecosystems, these networks of nonprofits, partners, churches mm -hmm. that we really are hoping to leverage um, in order to really advance and ensure people are connected. Um, when we come to the challenge of uh, the device, I think it's important that we, a few years ago, released the Lewis Latimer Digital Plan for Inclusion and Equity. Um, in that plan, we looked at how do we move on affordability, access, and adoption. We cannot talk about adoption even if we have affordability and access, if we don't have the right devices, and we know that within our communities we're over-indexed with mobile. And so we're focused on how do we get more folks connected in the home. And that's why I love Michael being here, because those of us who are in this space, we tend to be these digital divide wonky people. <laughs> And he actually deals with real people, right, which I think has been a resonant theme. So thank you for that. Hey, Tracy, how are you? Hey, I'm pretty good. Thank you for having me. I wish I was really there live. But, I know. You know. The next time we'll make sure. Evening, all the events. So. No, I know. And Tracy and I have known each other for a really long time. Listen, this has been a historic investment in tribal lands and, and sovereign nations. We've never seen anything like this in my lifetime in terms of the type of investments. I'm curious from you, you know, how is that going to affect the communities you care about? And how do you see ACP? How do you see what's happening with the digital divide? Just really making an impact. Well, this investment is unprecedented. Uh, obviously, we <laughs> we have been stunned by it in Indian country uh, for sure, for sure. But I think what we're starting to see is that ACP will help sustain the new tribal networks that our communities are building. So that's going to be huge. It's going to help more people um, subscribe to internet services. So sustainability is what ACP means. Uh, it also helps with urban natives. Um, Y'all may not know, but 70, 75% of us at least live in urban situations or we're going from urban uh, back to reservations and back and forth. So 
having this to help our urban natives is, is huge as well. We saw so many of the same issues that the other folks have been talking about, um, you know, one device, overly subscribed to mobile, of course. And um, so it's, it's just um, exciting to see that we may be able, not only are we getting monies to create our own networks in our communities, we're gonna be able to have this, hopefully this program continue to sustain those networks as well. And that's why I like, I mean, we didn't plan for this, but I love the fact that this whole idea, again, when we look at the uh, investments that have been made in Indian country, again, this is about keeping people on, right? Because we haven't seen this, this is an unprecedented amount of money in infrastructure, which I think is pretty important, right? It is. It's, it's not only about keeping people on, it's about getting people right, on right, sustainably. Right. So we don't have networks in That's so many of our communities. And so as these other monies um, bridge that through, through now it's BEAD, but through um, spectrum opportunities and other things, as we build our own networks in our communities, this creates a sustainability and economic model that, that helps not only the community, but helps the persons on get online and stay online. So, yes. So I'm, I'm going to do an adaptation, Tracy. If you see it in a blog, I took it from you. Keeping people on, I mean, getting people on sustainably <laughs> is the yes, key. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's the key. That's the key. Now, Mike, in Virginia, you took this program and added money to it, which I found to be interesting when we were chatting about this as well. Talk a little bit about what Virginia is doing to kind of follow this model of keeping people on, make, getting people on sustainably. Yeah, the, the state is currently working on a digital opportunity plan and they're continuing to promote the affordable connectivity program. So ACP is a priority across the state. The state is at 30%. So they have, they're, uh, they're, they're leading our county. Our county, we're only at 15% of the eligible um, residents for ACP. Uh, one of the things that we decided to do was add an additional incentive for residents. So we're adding $20 a month to the ACP and we call that our ACP bridge. Mm -hmm. And we have two providers who have actually signed up for that. So for their um, people who have qualified, they're receiving an additional $20 a month benefit, which is dropping the cost to practically zero. Oh. And the interesting thing about that is that it, it incentivized one of our local small providers to work with us to put a senior apartment complex senior and disability apartment complex with our Piedmont Housing Alliance. So if you see the, the natural progression there, the funding works within the, the community, involves an outside agency, the Piedmont Housing Alliance, and ends up benefiting almost 36 residents. So we're, we're working to, to make sure that those residents, whether they're senior or disabled, now have the sustainability thing that we're working on. You can't just provide them with connectivity. You've got to go out there and give them digital skills so that they can provide and, and make sure that their community is working well together. And I'm curious, again, share with us where this extra $20 is coming from. Is it a commitment from oh, the yeah, provider good, or is it something point. coming I, from I, the, state, the state yes, funds? Yeah, I'd be remiss not to you know, put, put in uh, our, the props for our board of supervisors. So our elected officials made, made that determination and put it in the general fund. So when you think about appropriations, that appropriation came directly from the general fund, taxpayer funds in the county itself. So, so that's interesting because that kind of goes back to the first panel, right? If we actually move towards digital equity commissions or whatever the case may be, we might see some more continued support on the part of states. So it's very interesting that the state's actually enacting that. So thank you for sharing yeah. that. Uh, unfortunately, the state is still working on something like that. So, okay. Uh, you know, <laughs> oh, Maryland, <laughs> Maryland is the, the pilot. They, they've done a good job. They're, they're at $15. So. Okay. We said in Albemarle, let's do 20 and see if the state will follow. And, you and know, they maybe did. they will, maybe they, they, they won't. won't. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, it's interesting. It's a, it's a whole different model. I'd like to come back to that because it's yeah, a okay. different model, I think, based on the discussion of the first panel, for those of you who are here, where we're looking at where these resources come from. And if the original appropriation is, is a way to start it, if states also put some skin in the game, it could be an interesting proposition. can't happen for everybody, though. That's the only thing. But it's something that's interesting moving forward. Um, you know, Naomi, I want to kind of get real though. So we've been talking so nicely about ACP and how everybody wants it and wants to get on. Cost is not only the issue why people don't subscribe though, right? There's other reasons. So I want you to, based on your experiences in New York, talk a little bit about what you're also seeing. Like, you know, New York has a lot, I'm from New York, 
not everybody's walking down the street with an ACP flag talking about get right. online, right? That's but right. talk to us a little bit about the challenges that are occurring. Well, I can I can tell you when we did our ACP enrollment. Um, well, let me let me back up. When I was telling people at our church about ACP, they were like, "Huh? What?" And once we started educating them, they're like, "Oh." Well, let me sign up, or if I don't qualify, my sister qualify and my cousin qualify. And once I started telling them and listing the different programs, like if you get WIC, if you are having veterans benefits, they were like, oh, wait a minute, my uncle qualifies for this. And my uncle just moved to a new apartment, or my uncle's in a senior. So a lot of people don't know about it. Um, the role of, of, of the institution is to support and to educate. And that brings one of the biggest values of when we're educating and telling them about the ACP. When we were signing up and doing our National ACP Day uh, last year, people were walking by and they had no clue that they even qualify. I mean, there were moms in that had, you know, coming with, with their babies and they were like, wait a minute. You telling me I can get this at a discount rate? I'm like, yes, why haven't you signed up? And they will go through the process and they sign up. And I have people that will call back or family members of those individuals saying, thank you for signing up my cousin. She really needed this. She didn't even know that all this money that they were trying to choose, should I buy milk, should I buy bread, or do I keep the internet on so my children can do their homework? And that's to me, I mean, that goes back to, and Tracy, I want to just jump to you real quick because I know similarly um, in Indian country, there's probably some issues too about people understanding how important the program is or knowing about it at all. But that goes back to the earlier conversation, right? Where does this program fit and where do people see connectivity compared to other things that they're experiencing, which are real experiences, right? And the trade-offs that we make, um, Tracy, what about among your constituents? I mean, is it is it been easy, difficult? Is it about awareness raising? Uh, are we still just at the beginning of this? <laughs> um, it, you know, in some ways, we're at the beginning of this. Uh, we don't have the networks in the same way that um, other communities do. Uh, so, you know, we don't. Ha- our anchor institution is our school. Our anchor institution on on the tribal community is um, our tribal government. In urban situations, we're even more dispersed. So getting that um, information out has been super hard in the urban communities. Uh, I've been I suggested recently I um, met with the commissioner um, Je- uh, Jessica Rosenworcel and I suggested that we work with Indian centers. There are Indian centers in most of the major cities, which are social service organizations that were formed in the mid 50s and 60s. And these are folks that are frontline and, you know, helping folks sign up for other things. So that might be a solution, but we've just had difficulty uh, getting outreach into the urban versus the reservation uh, community. So there's still a lot of work to be done. We're still working on that. It's, it's been different. It was the same thing with EBB before that. We didn't have enough time to even get the messaging out in a lot of ways. So. It, it's a, we're a little different of a population, so um, and we don't have the same institutions to rely on that are there. So that's been harder. Yeah, and I, I, just to stay on this for a moment, and I wish the other panel had kind of converged because this is a policy question as well for my friends who are, who are practitioners. You know, in our ideal world, we would have hoped that the infrastructure money and the digital equity money would have gone to non-traditional anchor institutions, right? And so there would have been something about... Um, when you think about the pandemic, many of the stories that you saw were young people sitting on the stoops of churches or sitting on the stoops of community-based organizations or receiving free lunch and housing, right? And, you know, Mike, you're shaking your head, you know. It puts us at a disadvantage also when the ACP and the bead funding are kind of combined to support non-traditional anchor institutions. I, Michael, I'm coming to you real quick. Let me just go to Mike because you're shaking your head. Well, I, I will say, you know, the importance of the rural community is, is centered on the churches for sure. I mean, it, it happens in our county. I'm sure it happens in most rural counties. There's also the country stores that have been there with families forever. You know, sustaining them is an important part of keeping our rural communities vibrant and, and providing them with that type of skill set. I mean, you're bringing everybody in to pick up a device or something like that. I mean, you, you, sh- you don't need to block it anyway. Mm-hmm, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Michael's like, look, don't put me in this policy stuff. <laughs> but you talk about digital literacy, though. I mean, let's move it from the anchor institutions and why it's important 
Oh, why it's important. I'm sorry. I thought I was for a minute. I wasn't. I was in my living room <laughs> at a table talking to my friends. But in terms of digital literacy and the census that the Urban League has, is that another way to sort of get the word out about these programs or things that we need to do? I definitely think so. I think, again, going back to, as I was articulating, our plan is based on not only on, on adoption. And in order for folks to adopt these tools and resources, they have to understand them. They have to have the tools necessary to do so. Um, and then we have to continue to support them on this journey. Um, as we look at our constituents, we know that they've historically been locked out of economic systems, of this great influx of growth that's come out of the tech industry. Um, and so what, what we see is uh, we're really focused on not only ensuring that there is trust. Yes. And we are leveraging that trust in our local affiliates to engage because, you know, we hear from them. They don't necessarily trust, and I, and, and I don't want to speak out of time here, but they don't trust the Internet service providers. They do trust their local service provider who's also assisted them through um, that. And because we have that integrated local po presence and ability to really connect local coalitions, it helps us to further bolster our literacy. Well, I like that because, I mean, the Urban League was responsible for helping us think about digital navigators, right? Um, and people who are trusted from the community play a role in actually telling people about these programs and making people trust technology. Okay, I'm going to age myself. When I started this about three decades ago, I used to work for this company called One Economy, and we were giving people refurbished computers to their home. And we would take the computer in and we'd set it up. And then I'd come back two weeks later and it had a cloth over it, covering it up and a coffee mug on top of it. <laughs> and I used to say, why is this computer have a you know, blanket over it and a cup of coffee? This was all in the 90s. And somebody would say in the household, because somebody was looking inside that computer at us. And we had to cover it up, right? Plus, we didn't have a table to put our coffee. <laughs> so this was a perfect place to put a cup of coffee. My point is that has not changed for certain communities, right? Just based on, you know, the fact that we haven't done the training and we haven't had trusted ambassadors. Naomi, coming back to you in New York and Tracy, coming back to you. I mean, how important is that also going to be in this equation? We do have money that's digital equity funding that's also in the pipe. Should we be thinking about more ways to engage communities like yourselves and you know what I mean practitioners like yourself in those areas as well oh most definitely we should be looking for more ways on how to engage I mean um, I, I like to, I always say it starts with the leadership you know um, and one of the things coming from a church background the first thing we say is that it's not the devil <laughs> um, you know they're not they're, 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 there's nothing that's going to be taken from you um, but we have to we, we have to remove these scarecrows out of our conversations out of our communities to say this is our future this is what you know if if you see your grandchildren doing something in a corner with a device you know it's good let them let them have that time with that device you know um and there's ways you monitor um we have to we have to be able to educate and to be able to to show them how to use the the different devices and the different technologies, you know, there's, I, I'm, I'm still, you know, amazed of the people that still do their taxes by paper. And when I'm telling them like, why are you sitting, I'm trying to call for my refund, um, um, uh, Minister Dale. And I'm like, go online. Mm -hmm. And they're so amazed when I'm showing them how to go online to check for their refund. Mm -hmm. And it's because we're not teaching them. And then I'm just like, who's your tax consultant? Because you need to fire them. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's more of us as, as leaders. We have to educate. We got to get that information um, down there. Um, one of the things that in our church that we have is that about 30 of our leaders are right now in school for AI. They're learning. So once you get connected to the internet, it's not, it's not just for you just to have it and it's just like as something luxury, but it's no, now it's time for you to utilize it. Now it's time for us to start having our families to start using that as a job application and let's stop telling our teenagers to get on the mobile device to fill out a job application. Let's show them how to properly uh, navigate through the computer, how to properly properly go through and research the information so that we can be on the same playing field. Yes. Tracy, do you want to jump in too from what you're seeing? Yeah, it's a it's a bit different in our communities because you gotta remember we're we're five hundred and seventy-four 
sovereign nations on 334 reservations, not including 70 plus percent or 80 percent urban. So it's 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 not our it's some of it's our leaders. But the other thing we have to remember is that Indian country is predominantly young. Our population is at more than half under 30 and last census, not this recent. I haven't had time to do the update yet. More than half of that was under 18. So these are native digital natives. Yeah. They get it. And they've been interacting with, we see things like interacting with elders, texting in language, things like that. So it's it's really different. It's more, um, we know we need to be online. And we have always had a history of being early adopters of new technology. Uh, I'm guessing that's why we've survived and persevered is because, you know, is a, is a stone pot better? I mean, is a clay pot better than a metal cooking pot? Probably not bring it you know i think i think that's why we're early adopters and we're out there pushing it uh, i mean early on i've been in this a while you know early on before the last b top folks were not sure leadership was not sure about this but the leadership has changed and our leaders are younger now so we know we need to get online we we get that it's just um it's a different process uh, we see the possibility for sustaining culture and protecting culture through it in fact, it's a term that we talk about a lot at AIPI, digital sovereignty. And watch for my forthcoming book on that. Yeah, I know, right? Tell me when, yes. You know, and I think it's so interesting, and I just want to stay on this for one second, then I want to go to Mike. The differences of agency, which is why I think afford, moving affordability out of the way helps, right, when it comes to sustainable connectivity. Um, you know, if we look at the ACP and historically other subsidy programs or discount programs, it's allow people to partake in the way that they're comfortable. The same token, there is a difference when you are black or Latina and you're surveilled and you see that technology the same way that the people put the blanket over the technology. There was a feeling of Big Brother looking in. And so there has to be a conversation as we have these funds to develop this as a trustworthy tool that is not going to basically invert itself and become something that is discriminatory. We're already seeing the consequences, right? Kids who were not online are suffering regressive learning loss, uh, health disparities of um, young women who did not take advantage of telehealth are now dealing with, you know, uh, advanced stage uh, uh, chronic di advanced stage disease. And I'm seeing it in my own research as I think about how people interact with that technology. So I think that's a really important point that we should have a conversation on, right? The digital divide is part of the conversation on AI. <laughs> because again, as these technologies evolve and they replace, I think what the gentleman said there in terms of telephone or analog systems, they become really critical to survival. And Mike, that brings me to you, right? Because at the end of the day, a lot of the decisions will rest upon uh, states and localities to make decisions around closing the divide. So when you build that bridge, what are you trying to solve too? At the, at, while this is all said and done, it's nice to give people a computer and access, but is there a long-term goal of what the county wants to solve by doing that bridge to affordability? Right, good, good question. Thank you, Nicole. I'm Excited to say we're working on our own regional digital equity program. So it's a coalition of around 30 agencies. So you really have got to be spread out long and wide. You definitely need to talk to all of the different community agencies that are out there and build a coalition that does a plan that brings that digital skills training directly to the people where they are. That, that trustworthiness is, is big. We hear it a lot. You called it scarecrows, I think, right? Yeah, that's a great A term, country man. reference, yeah, right? That. A rural so, reference yeah, for an yeah, urban they're, person. They're not really there, and they used to serve a purpose, but it's, it's kind of like bringing them down. You know, it's like, so, you know, that's, that's one of the things that we're working really hard on. Mm -hmm. And we have some funding, fortunately. Another example of, you know, the federal government is stepping in, mm -hmm. and we're going to be doing the ACP outreach. So we have a, a grant that's coming for our region, not just for our county. So again, you know, this doesn't, you know, it doesn't stop at one border. It's all about working together across multiple jurisdictions to provide service across the regions. There, there's no more separation between counties now. It's all like we're all working together to, to bring ACP to more people. And then from there, digital skills development.
And I would assume, Michael, for the Urban League, this is a constituent building movement, right? To make sure that there's digital literacy and access for, like you said, going into the economic mainstream. Yes. So um, when we look at this, we see it as much a further, I guess, a deeper issue than just the consumer. The way we see it is we're not just consumers, we're business owners. We are, there's job creation. There's so much more that comes out of getting somebody connected and acclimated to a tech space um, that we hope to precipitate to this work. That's right. Well, my colleague, my uh, Jack Malamud and I just wrote a piece on workforce is digital equity to sort of bring these conversations in there. Healthcare is digital equity, right? Uh, mental health is digital equity. I think it's a way, again, taking that agency of where people live, the spaces in which they live, the places in which they pay, p play, the places where they feel empowered to use the technology to help them solve problems. Um, I'm getting to y'all. Like, you see, I'm over here. I'm just fangirling. Like, this is what I love to talk about. But we will actually come to all of you with questions. If you have questions online, just hashtag it to ACP Future or to Brookings at, what's the email again? I'm all in the conversation. Events at brookings.edu. I'm all in the event. I've only done this for seven years, but my mind is thinking about all of these opportunities of having local practitioners actually on the stage. It just humbles my heart to actually have this conversation. So the last question I would ask before we get to Q&A, hey, look, my friend right here, see, they trained you very well. <laughs> you tell me what you're doing in your job prospects. Um, my next question, though, is, so what happens if this program goes away? I mean, is there a real cost to it, Tracy, if the program goes away? Let's start with you. Like, let's say some of the fears that we heard spoken about on the first panel come true, that we run out of money or for some reason it gets into the, a political logjam. What happens? What do we do? What happens? It will be, it'll be the key to, um, it'll go away. I mean, in Indian country, affordability programs and subsidies, they offset the cost of building and maintaining our network. Because remember, we're not just end users, we're also governments. And so the governments are building networks for our end users, but the end users have the subscriptions. So it's more expensive to build on tribal lands um, and for a number of reasons. And there are less subscribers, less bang for the buck. That's why we don't have service there now. Um, so when you think about without for affordabilities, networks will become unsustainable. There's that word again, but I am from ASU. We are the sustainability school, they say. So, um, but internet service will be just too expensive and networks won't have the funding for repair and maintenance. And our communities will continue to fall behind without access to the digital world. So we're look, we have to look at it. And I thought about that from some of the other questions you've been talking about. We've got to remember we're governments and we're supporting end users. So we got two different audiences we're talking about here in our communities. So if the government builds a network, but there's not enough end users because the subsidies go away, then the tower, what, it becomes signage? I mean, you know, I don't know. It's a, it's a problem. And we are hearing that, that um, they're gonna claw back some of the investments and such. They're already working on bills to claw back some of the monies from Indian country. We're, we've already heard that. So we're worried about it. Yeah. We need this program. Mm -hmm. Mike? Yeah, I'd like to talk about it from the service provider, the internet provider perspective. If the money goes away, what we're doing is we're putting things back to where they were. You know, the major providers will benefit the most. And what that means is that you've got lack of competition. So competition is going to be really important for reliability, especially in the rural areas. If you only have one provider in a specific area, when they're down, they're down, and they're going to hold you to whenever they want to bring the service back up. So competition will be very important without the affordability programs. I think there, there's going to be a lack of competition, and the rural areas will suffer the most. Mm -hmm. Naomi? Well, I I would say this is that it's definitely I did um everyone what they said it will take us back um you know already we're seeing the digital divide uh, extremely in the black community so this is just going to take us backwards you know ACP uh, supports to mute the cost when it comes to the internet server so, um, the internet service provider so. Um, we we can't we can't get rid of it. Mm -hmm, mm 
And Michael? Sure. So I'll say this. Um, as we think about this work, uh, we see that there is a rural-urban divide, but there's also, as you say, a racial divide. And we are seeing that in urban centers where most of our affiliates are, um, they are seeing three times the lack of access than their rural counterparts. So as we roll out this initiative and begin to connect them, what I'm saying is we run the risk of isolating and further dis enfranchising people who have already historically been locked out of the system, and that's unacceptable. So rather through this substitute or another, there, there has to be a way to not only connect, but to maintain um, their presence. Well, and I'll give you another story too. This was before the pandemic when I was doing my book research. I, I wrote about this actually, it's on the Brookings uh, webpage, but I went to a place in Stanton, Virginia, where I met a fourth generation um, African-American gentleman who was a day laborer who could not afford the uh, continuing cost of service. And he, when I met him, it was in the middle of the month, and he was unemployed. And I said, uh, why are you unemployed? You know, any jobs down here, blah, blah, blah. And he said, no, ma'am. He said, this thing that the Internet, when I can't pay for it, I have to wait until, you know, I'm able to figure out ways to negotiate through open Wi-Fi, whatever the case may be, because an email address is like an address. It's like a phone number, you know, and if I can't get online, it means I got to wait until, you know, my girlfriend or somebody else can help me with that. My point is, this is like a non-negotiable tool. And I do love the way this conversation has happened. And Chase, I've been doing this for a long time, really long time. When we first started talking about this, we either said, build it with fingers crossed that people will come. And now we're saying, build it, and we've got something to at least bring people to come. And if we don't imagine what that society looks like going forward, it's hard to say what's going to happen. And I love the point that was brought up with networks that have the potential to become obsolete or non-upgradable because we lose the subscribers. So this, this is a good point, folks, because we're going to go on Q&A, because it demystifies the idea that the program is just making everybody else rich. The bottom line is we need a program that's going to actually be corollary to the, you know, parallel to the investments we're making. Not just at NTIA, but the trillions of dollars also being made by the National Treasury in terms of the U.S. Treasury Department of Capital Funds, the funds that we're actually seeing with regards to other FCC programs. There's trillions of dollars of broadband infrastructure money out there. And so, again, it's just been a really interesting conversation to see how these are parallel. Something that we'll be writing about at Brookings. All right, let's go to Q&A. Uh, oh, good, we have a lot, Catalina. So let's, we'll start with my friend here, and then we'll go to you, because, you know, I did promise you that question. So you got the, oh, Catalina, can we, can we go here for, I mean, he had his hand up first. You know, I got to, right? <laughs> um, well, thank you again. You might want to say your name again in case people chimed in. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for this incredible panel. My name is Ruben Roy. Just to reintroduce myself, I just graduated with my bachelor's degree in computer science from George Washington University, where I was also a privacy researcher. Um, I really appreciated all of the insights on the many different marginalized communities that are affected by this divide. My question is about one demographic that crosscuts many of the ones that were discussed today. I'm kind of curious from both a community partner outreach perspective, but also from a government outreach perspective, what the efforts to address this divide for returning citizens has looked like so far. So I can, I can take, take this question because uh, one of the things that um, we did during our National Day of ACP, uh, we were signing up um, a lot of different people from that were from all different types of cultures, immigrants. Um, I mean, we had our bilingual people. We had people that were speaking Creole, French, you know. Um, and some of these people are part of our ministry and that are leaders in our ministry. So they were able to uh, talk to them um, more about the ACP. And then some of them, you know, with in, in, this, in New York City, we are having a slight um, housing with the unhousing uh, issue. And that is something that um, we, we got to figure out because for them to have internet service, they need a physical address, you know, like this is where they live. So a lot of that we had to kind of go back and explain. Some of them were uh, still in shelter, but that is something that I know that the government, we have to um, be able to provide some type of support to, but we are working with those that need 
that qualifies. Yeah, and like I said, I've been following this, and you gave me a good idea for a blog, which is Asian American Pacific Islanders, for example, have been part of the Broadband Outreach uh, Initiatives. Uh, OCA uh, has actually been running some of those initiatives at the D.C. level, but engaging local partners. Like I said, if I could actually filled up this whole aisle with more like an audience, theater audience versus a panel, Trust me, I would have had everybody here because I've been amazed about the level of cultural sensitivity that we've seen in some of the broadband outreach when it comes to this program. But we'll follow up with you as well. Those are great questions. Um, found, oh, no, before we go there, found, you just got to hold one sec, just one sec. Okay, yep. Mm-hmm. I promised my friend I was going to get him in at the last panel. So let me just honor my commitment. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate you know, it. We know each other, yes. uh, Ken Fielding with Storm Center Communications. Uh, we're a uh, technology company that does geospatial mapping. So we try to connect uh, people to data for various case uses. And we've been in conversations with the FCC about a real-time, accurate, high-speed broadband map, which still seems to be lacking, which might also be a contributing factor to understanding who does have high-speed broadband, who doesn't, where those needs need to be focused to make this this program and other programs more efficient. So my concern is, of course, technology equity. Um, reach out to technology startups. Yep. They can be a great tool and a great resource to help fuel this program right. where the FCC or other programs can't. Mm-hmm. Uh, our small technology company is actually attempting now to reach out to HBCUs, yes. tribal colleges, Hispanic colleges, because we can collaborate and lend our technology to those communities to prepare for the next pandemic, to prepare for climate change, to identify where high-speed broadband needs to be so that there won't be as much of a technology divide and people won't still be left further and further behind. We're behind already. We're talking about 5G. There's 6G and 7G. And not to mention uh, degenerative AI. So there's just a lot of pieces that need to be connected so you need to put pressure on everybody, uh, but also rely on small industry technology companies because I think they can be a resource that we haven't really tapped into. Yes, thank you for that, Ken. I mean, I, th- I would think in Virginia, are you all trying to figure out, like, pri- local companies that can also assist? I think from a, I, I, it brings up Chamber of Commerce. I mean, they're the ones who are supporting the small businesses that are around, and I think that's a... It's a great idea to bring those smaller companies in, especially if they're local and know the community. So right. something we'll definitely take back to where we are. We've got a couple of uh, entrepreneurs that are doing this type of work local and through the Chamber of Commerce. I think you open that up to a broader spectrum. Yeah. And I mean, and I, I just add on, Chase Allen, like, I think you're right. I mean, I think we do need a comprehensive map. The FCC just announced an upgrade to the existing map that appears that it will be better. Uh, but if, if I had my genie in a bottle, it should be much more granular at the place-based level. We actually look a little bit deeper on uh, social institutions and census-level data. I mean, I also want to bring up, too, as we think about broadband, you know, we just signed a debt ceiling deal, and unfortunately, we saw some casualties to HBCUs and tribal lands when it came to unab- unobligated funding. And so, again, I think keeping these conversations top of mind, we're not going to get to where you're talking about, Ken, unless we have the funds from the federal level and they understand the role of the eco system in actually creating this type of change. And that's where many of you who are sitting here in the work that you do have to just keep having those conversations that it takes, you know, this is all hands on deck, particularly when the investment is so high, there's enough to go around for everybody. (laughs) The question is uh, really what these state plans and digital equity plans are going to look like in June and the extent to which we respond to them as well. So I'll keep it like that. But to your point, there's been funding, but some funding may not be available to do some of the stuff that you're talking about. Um, I'm just going to say something quickly. Um, oh, you need a microphone so people oh, can hear you. I'm sorry. I want to talk to the panelists. Hi, Tracy. Good to see you. That's my co-partner of many things. Um, talk to me about what it means to unenroll 14 million people from the ACP as I know we were going to get to that question, but we didn't get to it in our panel, but I would love for them as community anchor institutions to talk about what would it mean to unenroll 14 million people? How does it erode community trust for the organizations and the communities and the networks you work with? Give it to me, because I think people need to understand we would have to unenroll 40 billion people. 
Well, a billion. <laughs> Woo. Like, what? As I say, billion. Woo, that's a lot of work. Yeah, that's <laughs> twenty million, probably. Right, but it's all said and done. But yeah, yeah, that, that that is a whole lot of people. But I know um, with our faith based institution, mm-hmm. that shows that 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 will bring mistrust within um, within our social structure because here we have we're supposed to be a trusted institution, and here we are enrolling people and telling people that, you know, this is the future that we need to be in and to take it away is just going to bring us backwards. Yep. I would say not only mistrust, but when we talk about how we've transformed during the pandemic to be more digitally connected, right. to deliver these services yeah. in a new way, the not only is it we've led them down the wrong path, in quotes, we now can't even connect with them and offer them the services as we have supported and encouraged them over the last several years. Tracy? Tracy? Oh, well, goodness. Um, you know what it made me actually think of is, I mean, of course it's going to erode trust, but um, I don't know how much our community, I mean, it all comes from the federal government. Our community's already done with trust, the federal government. So, um, but what I really think is how are they actually going to do it? I'm thinking of the student loan program <laughs> and how are they going to ramp back up payments? all at once. So how are they going to actually unroll all at once? And uh, so that's kind of what I was thinking. I think it's a logistical nightmare. I don't think it's, I think they'll put caps on it before they disenroll everyone. They'll, you know, put things like that on it. But I think it'd be a nightmare. And I think that it would, it would absolutely erode trust, but I also don't think people trust the internet already. That's one of the issues that we see, especially with older populations is, you know, not, not trusting. Um, I know from personal experience when my dad got older, he disengaged everything. He could build computers. He couldn't even run the cell phone by then. He didn't want anything to do with it. He didn't trust anything. And so, um, and we work a lot in our communities on cybersecurity because, you know, we are running networks as well. So there's a lot of mistrust and there's mistrust of using our, our um, appropriated imagery and culture in ways that are offensive. And so there's, there's already mistrust. I think it'll just be, I think Indian country will just think it's par for the course um, and not be surprised, sadly. Yeah. Uh, we're and, a little and, cynical like that. And then Mike, I mean, we talked about in the first panel, this is not just an urban tribal, this is everybody, right? That is in some way counting on that extra bridge funding, counting on ACP. Yeah, I think before it goes away, there has to be a plan to keep things level set. So we, I think we can all recognize that. I still go back to Naomi's thing. We're doing all this work to bring down a scarecrow. I'm afraid of the internet. You know, now we're going to like take it away from and we're going to start building a bigger and badder one, right? I mean, that's that would be a real mistake, right? So... Yeah, and as a policymaker, it also makes me think one thing, too, that hasn't been part of this conversation, Paul and Fallon. It could potentially put burden on the states to overperform or outperform any type of uh, misalignment of the program. So that's something I think is interesting that we should talk about. I got one question here, but Paul, are you responding to my question here? Can you hold that question? Or... Yep. One here, and then last one, we'll end with Paul. But this has been quite interesting. Thank you all for uh, your questions. Yep. Uh, thank you all again for hosting this, um, both great panels, actually. My name is Addie Inka. I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs at Education Superhighway. We work with a number of states, localities, and community-based organizations on ACP awareness and um, adoption. To piggyback on um, Dr. Wilson's question about you know, taking this benefit away, we're really starting to see some partners question about their role in promoting a program where there's no certainty around whether it will be here this time next year. Could you talk a little bit about how your organizations are navigating that and um, just generally like creating that sense of urgency at the federal level that a decision needs to be made now because states are creating their plans and your organizations are so invested in making sure that people get connected? (laughs) That was for the first panel. (laughs) I was up. Any response, Tracy? (laughs) I mean, look, I'll respond. I mean, I think we're at a lucrative moment right now where these digital equity plans, I think we heard it from Mike in terms of digital equity plans being developed by state. I really don't think that states are thinking about the partisan discussions on the ACP while they're developing their state plans. I think they're really thinking about 
how do we do a good job so when they go to NTIA, these plans can be approved? Um, you know, one thing that we should consider for those of us working in the space is how these programs have been parsed out with our sister agencies, but they're very much combined. And I think that going forward, what we have to just keep raising awareness around, my friend, right, is that these are actually correlated experiences. And the more infrastructure we build, we don't want to be like an I aged myself earlier, well, we had a lot of broadband, but not a lot of consumers. And this was in the 90s, I could tell you, when we first started these programs. Or we can go back a couple of years, we had a lot of federal investments, but not a lot to show for it. Um, where we had a lot of digital equity programs, in fact, in the second BTOP, but we didn't have a lot of sustainability on the ground. Remember, Tracy, because we didn't have the funding for those things. So we have this moment and movement, really, like Alan Davidson says, to do both at the same time, but we have to figure out how to make the community accountable to, with the policymakers, which is why I wanted to do the panel the way I did. It's a conversation that doesn't often happen where you have the people who are sort of having the policy directives sit down with the people who are responsible for doing this really hard work. And so we're going to keep talking about that. Um, we do have another blog coming out on that. I'm not going to say it's in my book because I can't make you wait that long to hear my opinion. <laughs> As you all can tell, I have a lot to say on this. So I'm going to write about that now, and then later you'll see some other stuff in my book. But, you know, what we've been talking about at Brookings at our center is like sort of pairing these investments with these uh, – uh, demand side initiatives to make sure everything works. All right. I got one. Oh, Paul. Okay. So I'm going to take Paul's question. I'll take your question at the same time, give it to the panel and then let them go home. We've been, I've been sitting here long enough. <laughs> I haven't moved for two hours. <laughs> so let's uh, go to Paul and then we'll go to the other. Yeah. That was a really good question before on the I main. If you, if you see the cliff, yep. do you take your foot off the gas? Do you pump the brakes? You know, what, you know, what do you do if you're, if you're a broadband provider and, and you're involved in the program, so it's a, it's a real issue. Uh, tra I, I had a question. I, I, Tracy kind of gave us a little bit of a nugget uh, earlier, and, and Nicole on the earlier panel, you made a comment that I, I, didn't, I didn't jump on. But, but one, one of the issues with the current programs is they're heavily focused on CapEx. So they're basically designed to pay for the building and deployment of networks, but not the running of companies. Um, and one of the good things about ACP is actually it's an OPEX kind of a, uh, a program. So you're paying for services and, and paying for OPEX over time. If, if ACP ends, we we're, we're already hearing from a lot of the, especially smaller uh, network operators uh, like in, in Indian country or in rural areas um, who are expressing concerns about their ability to maintain their, their companies, you know, in the long run. In other words, there'll be no programs to cover any OPEX. Um, if we take away the the affordable connectivity program, that that adds further pressure on that. I just wonder, Tracy, if you know what you're hearing from uh, the, the companies you, you work with on that issue. Um, we're hearing some of that. I have to admit, I've not been at all those conversations because I'm not the only person on our team that works on this. And so, and this week is National Congress of American Indians Mid Year Conference. So I know. For a fact that they are that one of the, that they're con discussing this right now, I think, I think tribes are going to act as if because we've still got these other monies and we've got other programs we can plug into like USDA, RUS, and thing you know things like that where we can plug in and patch. We're used to patching. I think tribes might slow down, but they'll they'll patch and plug with other programs to some extent, or they'll find a way to offset it in other ways. I don't think tribes will stop building it because we've never had this kind of investment for the building of the infrastructure, which we didn't even have infrastructure. So I don't think that they'll, that this will stop that. I think it's just going to rearrange and change the way things are done. Look, we're resilient in Indian country. We're going to figure out a way to make it work, but it's, it's going to be, um, it's going it, to, it's, it's hard for us in Indian country because we're such a small population. And there's so few of us who have the expertise that we end up depending a lot on, on um, outsiders. Uh, Johnny come latelys is what I call them. You know, folks that haven't been in the space, but they see the money. And so we need to get our communities to talk about it and create the solutions that work in each community. And that's, so it's going to be a local level response as opposed to an overarching Indian country response. It's going to be a tribal level or maybe a regional level response, I would think. Right. So that, that I haven't heard anything, but like I said, the meetings are happening right now where people will discuss this. So 
Right. And, and Paul, I would just say on that, and we'll just wrap up with this last question. Um, so Xavier, by the RA, and I are writing this piece on the ACP supply demand. Jack and I also have another piece on what you talked about, the CapEx, which is redirecting, giving the FCC back spectrum um, auction authority and redirecting some of the revenues to this stuff. Um, so as you all know, there are other ways in which we generate money around broadband infrastructure, one of them being spectrum allocation. And so we're writing a blog, Jack and I, right now to say, is there an opportunity to take a portion of those funds and actually redirect it to some of these really fragile programs, at least in the short term, so that you're, you're pulling from the, the investment architecture that, you know, in spectrum auctions, I guess we got to have something on this too, Jack. <laughs> are really a big game changer when it comes to revenue investments. And it's just an idea that could potentially fund the ACP in the long term if we continue to, to create this log jam. Okay. But I've written about was, three blogs in this panel. Go ahead, Tracy. <laughs> I was just going to pop in on Spectrum, though. In Indian country, we have had tri tribal priority in Spectrum. Yes. And we are going to be asking for it again. Yes. So that can offset things. Yeah, it can. Well, and, it, and what it does is, again, it helps with some of the uh, – CapEx investments that are very high that, you know, obviously it have to be conversations on fiber maintenance and all this other stuff that's going to happen. But we shouldn't be trying to figure out how to get the money to spend this when we know that we can actually raise it through other means that are part of the technology ecosystem. That's just my point. Nicole, you know, I do want to say one other thing is that we have to make sure that our voice is loud. We got to yes. uh, keep letting our communities know, get on to the hill, keep telling our stories and showing uh, how important to keep this funding. Well, and that's what I love about all of you. And we are definitely getting to your question. Stand up. You get to say something. <laughs> like my kids say, Mom, you talk all the time. Stop talking <laughs> about this stuff. Give us your last question, and then we'll wrap up and set everybody on their way. But you got to keep it short. Don't make a dissertation, because then I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> okay. This is primarily for National Urban League and our reverend on stage. Um, I think especially you see so often you have, I could name how many CMEs, AMEs, AME Zions, and rural populations that are running drives to get people signed up for SNAP, to get people signed up for WIC, yeah. because there's a lack of education on how to actually operate within those programs. And welfare, you know, is supposed to be streamlined to make, allow you to fare well. But they're so convoluted and so complicated. And I see the same issue of almost tainting ACP with the word welfare of, you know, I think there's a danger in vernacular there. But my question really is, what is the education process of once you get people connected and staying connected, how do you allow them to be able to use the systems? You mentioned they're covering their, blank, their computer up with a blanket or whoever. I can't remember who said that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we talk about dignified aging. How do you allow older populations in yeah. these congregations that we're working with to be able to use these in a way that allows them to stay connected in a dignified way? That's right. So if I can, I'll just give each of you one word. <laughs> one word. Not one character, but like one, you know what I'm talking about, like two seconds response so we can leave with some power at the end of this panel after two hours. Okay. Partnership. Thank you. Oh, see, Michael, thank you. You actually, I didn't think I was going to do it. <laughs> okay, if I have to give one. Okay. Just connection. Yes. Enthusiasm. Yes. Tracy? Seat at the table. Okay, she used three, but that's okay. <laughs> well, with that, all of the above. Let's give our panel a huge round of applause. Thank you all for joining us at the Center for Technology Innovation. We follow this and other these this and other issues that are related to our tech policy ecosystem. Please continue to follow us. Listen to our podcast. We'll be picking up a podcast on this as well. And the trillion blogs I mentioned will eventually be out in addition to Tracy's book and my book. But we thank you. We appreciate you. And let's keep talking about this. Thank you.